but uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, theory of ideology, which also has its uh, a part of its origin uh, here, because it, it was a uh, the book, the uh, ideology of power and the power of ideology was the sequel to uh, the, uh, uh, the book on what does the ruling class do in the room. So I uh, uh, tried to fill in I mean, some of the uh, issues of um, political power uh, left hanging after this uh, analysis of the state. And this was also something, I mean, which we started to discuss here uh, in, in, um, in 1977. Uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, say something about that book, or the kind of the conception of, of ideology in uh, uh, that book, and then uh, look into uh, what I think uh, we are uh, discerning uh, right now going on, uh, which is a, a new kind of uh, political dynamic of ideology, which we can notice in the uh, social movements uh, in the beginning of this uh, century, not the least in mean, the, the movements of 2011. Well, uh, I uh, remember, I mean, I found it uh, uh, extremely interesting and, and, and fascinating when I uh, uh, reflected upon uh, Althusser's uh, uh, essay on uh, ideological uh, state apparatuses and uh, uh, his fear of how ideology interpolates subject or speaks to subject. Um, the first thing, I mean, which was struck me when uh, uh, thinking about this was the, the, uh, uh, the very interesting duality of the, of the concept of subject, uh, which apparently uh, uh, hadn't been very much thought about uh, before. And, and uh, uh, Althusser himself, I mean, didn't really touch upon this. Uh, and it's quite clear, I mean, in the, in the meaning of the uh, English word subject, and you have the same uh, meaning in, in French, um, um, that a, a subject is, on the one hand, uh, someone who is uh, subjected to something or somebody. You have the subjects of the king or the subjects of the queen. Um, and, and in that sense, I mean, the subjects are uh, uh, contrasted to citizens, for instance. I mean, citizens of a democracy or a republic. Um, but at the same time, I mean, subject uh, also means uh, the opposite of being subjected to something. I mean, being, being, uh, being able to, uh, to be a subject means to be an autonomous actor. Uh, it, it's a, uh, on the one hand, it's uh, subject is uh, the opposite of citizen, uh, on the other, its subject is, is the opposite of being an object. Um, and uh, it's uh, the, this duality of, uh, of subject, uh, I think, is uh, something which is produced by a, an interesting uh, process of ideological formation of human beings, uh, which is at the same time a process of subjection and a process of qualification. Subjection to something or somebody and the qualification to become a, an autonomous actor. Uh, and human beings or uh, 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 are not slaves. Uh, have to, uh, in some way or the other, I mean, have to both be subjected and qualified. So this is, uh, uh, to some extent, I mean, a, a part of the human condition. And if we uh, uh, 
if you can follow, I mean, the argumentation so far, uh, this is something which then may explain uh, 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 to us uh, why at certain uh, moments uh, people rebel. Uh, and one such crucial moment which come, has come back again and again in, in human history is when uh, qualifications overrun subjection. This is something which is uh, uh, difficult to sort of uh, uh, measure empirically uh, in a priori. I mean, it's something which we tend to to uh, to notice uh, uh, afterwards. Although it's, it's sometimes we can uh, uh, see uh, problems building up. Um, the example uh, I, I mentioned here. Uh, uh, are fairly obvious. I mean, the, the, the rise of, of the uh, women's movement and of uh, feminism from the 1960s as a uh, product of the uh, post-war mass education of, of women. And uh, uh, we uh, have noticed in the, in the Arab Spring, particularly in, in the Egyptian uh, revolution, the uh, the importance of the new uh, IT qualifications of the Facebook and the Twitter generation. Uh, but I should say, I mean, that this is something of which we can sometimes discern in advance. Um, before uh, uh, rebels, uh, rebellions or revolutions happen. I mean, one thing which I noticed, and perhaps uh, many others did too, uh, was that um, uh, Arab patriarchy uh, has been undermined in the last 15, 20 years by the development of uh, uh, higher education of women in the Arab world. And um, uh, which not only has had the effect I mean, of, of uh, uh, qualifying uh, women, but also, for instance, I mean, concretely has had the effect of raising the, the marriage age of, of women in Libya from uh, 17, 18 years up to 27, 28. And uh, I think uh, it can uh, well be predicted, I mean, from a uh, sociological point of view, that, that it's, it's um, much more difficult, I mean, to uh, to subject or to tame a, uh, a highly educated a woman uh, in her late twenties than an uh, illiterate young girl of seventeen or eighteen. And that means that I think, I mean, that the uh, the attempt of the uh, new Libyan government to reintroduce polygamy in Libya is bound to failure. Um, but that's, uh, that's uh, another uh, matter, and it's actually an illustration rather than an, an argument. But it, I think this dialectical conception of, of ideology as uh, a, a, a always at the same time a process of subjection, subject, including subjection to an idea uh, for which you are prepared to sacrifice yourself. For I mean, subjection is not just subjection under an authority or a dictatorship uh, or patriarchal order, it's also a, a subjection to an idea, whether it's nationalism or socialism or uh, what have you. So that's the, the dialectical aspect of, of uh, the, the theory of ideology, which I think is it's still valid. I mean, it, uh, it's uh, not something I found reasons to to um, to qualify. Then there is the the uh, the old the classical problem of historical materialism and so on. I mean, what is a materialist? What is materialist determination? Um, and uh, all formulated differently. I mean, how does the the base determine the superstructure. What is the determination in the last instance? Uh, 
I don't think uh, 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 we need to, in order to understand ideologies, uh, to go into uh, exactly those terms of the debate. I think one way of, of putting it is that uh, ideological statements of whatever kind uh, have, are operating in what we may call an, a matrix of affirmations and sanctions. A matrix which is non-discursive although it may be argued that it's always perceived and, and communicated through discourse. Um, but unless, I mean, you are a, a completely committed idealist or discursive idealist, there is a certain difference between uh, being uh, uh, declared uh, uh, dead by a, a, uh, an ideological enemy, I'm mean, saying, I mean, that, uh, this is a not the uh, dead conception or dead theorist. Uh, and the, uh, on the other hand, uh, the uh, quite materialist uh, sanction of actually being killed by somebody. Um, so there is, I, uh, I think, I mean, this uh, matrix of affirmations and sanctions, which all ideologies have to uh, uh, operate in. They all of them have an enormous flexibility, an enormous capacity to sort of uh, um, try to uh, evade uh, or to explain away uh, uh, apparent failures of prediction and, and uh, uh, failures of uh, consistency with, with experience. But nevertheless, I mean, there is this matrix, and, and um, you uh, you run against it. I mean, at at your peril. So, uh, I mean, the um, the strength of, of of capitalist ideologies, liberal or conservative or what have you, or social democratic, um, are not just uh, uh, ideological uh, uh, statements. They, they have to be affirmed by, by something, supported by something, by economic growth, by growth of income, by chances of mobility. And um, there are also sanctions, of course, of, uh, 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 of, of trespassing, or sanctions against, I mean, trespassing the, uh, uh, the system of, of um, of capitalism. I was just reading a, uh, an article about the Icelandic crisis, uh, the banking crisis in Iceland, which you know almost bankrupted the whole country. And uh, it led to a, um, a regime change and, and the coming to power of a social democratic left green uh, government. Um, but it seems that in power, I mean, this kind of, this new government uh, has been uh, uh, forced uh, to, to continue uh, uh, I, an acceptance of the diktat of the IMF um, uh, in, in contrast, I mean, to what I had actually promised to do in the electoral campaign. Uh, under the threats of, of uh, disinvestment, of uh, credit squeeze, of capital flight, um, etc. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, operation of affirmations and, and, and sanctions is something we, we, which we can observe in, in action in crucial political changes. Um, there was a time uh, in, uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, when Eastern Europe and, and uh, the Soviet Union were growing economically uh, uh, rather well. And um, there was this, uh, this uh, ideology propounded by Khrushchev at the time that the Soviet Union would soon overtake the, the West and the United States economically. And uh, it did have, I mean, some plausibility. It certainly scared, I mean, the Kennedy 
administration quite a lot uh, in, in order to counter it. But then when in the 1980s it uh, uh, turned out, I mean, that this kind of ideology uh, did not correspond, I mean, to the experience of Eastern Europeans when they compared the standard of living in West Germany, or Finland, or Austria, or what have you. This was something, I mean, which actually uh, had strong uh, implications for the uh, plausibility of uh, the communist ideology, which by that time had become a, a very focused on uh, economic success and economic development, not so much on, on, on equality and emancipation and, uh, and so on, but on, on economic development and economic growth. And if this failed, then uh, uh, the, there was a, a, a vast movement of ideological disaffection from, uh, from the Soviet system. And uh, something much more dramatic, I mean, happened in, in, in the Arab world after the Ramadan uh, war of 1967, uh, when um, uh, the Israeli war machine uh, uh, crushed the, the Egyptian and the uh, Syrian uh, armies in, in six days. And that was the end, I mean, of uh, secular Arab nationalism and laid the ground uh, for the, for the um, uh, resurgence of Islamic in, in, the, um, in the Arab world. <coughs> Which now, in turn, I mean, has been uh, weakened because the experiences of Iran and Afghanistan have <coughs> shown some, thrown some doubt I mean, on the uh, idea that Islam is the solution. But it's not only, I mean, the affirmations of ideology which uh, may fail, there is also the, uh, when sanctions waver, I mean, when they are not uh, <coughs> effective, I mean, like in Eastern Europe, Eastern European implosion, and um, uh, that was also, I mean, what finally happened in, in, in Egypt, in, 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 in Tunisia. Oops. Um, so this uh, uh, matrix of affirmation and, and, and sanctions I think is, is a simple but uh, quite practical uh, uh, tool I mean, to deal with ideological mobilizations and ideological defection. Uh, there is also a, uh, an idea uh, which I think is, in, is important that uh, uh, is an, an interactive conception of ideology, and that ideologies, uh, uh, well, not always, but politically relevant ideologies, at least, are um, normally both ego ideologies and, and alter ideologies, alter ideologies of the other, uh, conceiving, I mean, the other either as, as threatening, as contemptible, as superior or as inferior, um, and the um, uh, with different relations, I mean, to to, uh, to myself or to us, to ego, <coughs> and this uh, could also take us, I mean, into processes of identity formation, which are. Uh, as an extension of this sort of study of ideology, um, which I think uh, has three crucial movement, no, moments. One is, I mean, of uh, a differentiation from from the adult. I mean, ego has whether I mean it's a, it's a small child or is a uh, is a class or a nation has to differentiate itself uh, or himself or herself from from the other uh, as a separate uh, separate uh, identity 
And then secondly, the the uh, uh, the process of the of self reference and, and the conception of the self. Who are we? Uh, which is uh, also an ideological process. And thirdly, I mean, there are the struggles for recognition and against recognition. And I think this ego and alter ideologies, or ego and other ideologies, um, are important to keep in mind uh, when we look at uh, ideological mobilizations, uh, processes of polarization, um, and, and for that matter, processes of ideological defection. And finally, uh, one thing which uh, uh, I think I learned uh, very much in, in, from, from Althusser, although this is a, a bit of an extrapolation of what he said explicitly, uh, but ideologies have to be seen or should be seen in, uh, in dynamically. And uh, uh, when I wrote this, uh, uh, this book on, on ideology of power, it was um, very much directed against uh, what at that time was the predominant uh, conceptions of uh, ideology in the broad sense of the word ideology, which was a concern with legitimacy. Um, my friend uh, Charles Offer, for instance, I mean, who, whom you know, um, I respect <coughs> very well, I mean, uh, wrote uh, a uh, an important book in the 1970s on legitimation problems of capitalism. Um, there was the discussion about consensus and its, uh, its importance in liberal democratic theory. There was the uh, predominant Marxian or Marxist preoccupation with class consciousness. And you had at that time, and, and much more of it later on, I mean, cultural mindsets of civilizations, and clashes of civilizations, and all that. All of them, uh, all these conceptions uh, tend to see uh, ideologies as fixed unit, unities. And uh, in, in, in contrast to this, the, uh, the kind of uh, ideological <coughs> conceptions uh, 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 which is uh, implied in, in this uh, a bit strange concept of artists of interpolations uh, refers to that ideology should be seen as uh, not as something uh, which you have as a uh, as a rucksack which you are carrying around uh, whether it's uh, 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 an Islamist culture or, or a uh, revolutionary class consciousness or what have you. Um, but uh, the ideologies operate uh, as always competing voices, <coughs> um, which means that, uh, uh, well, in principle, I mean, in, in North Korea, I mean, the number of competing voices you can hear are mean, obviously rather limited. Um, but there is an intrinsic multiplicity of, of ideologies and ideological identities and an intrinsic volatility, which I think is important to, uh, to bear in mind. And particularly if we're interested in social change and in processes of mobilization and, and defection. But that's the, the, the kind of uh, theory of ideology try to adumbrate uh, uh, in, in, in that book in which I I think um, I'm still think uh, uh, is a valid one and, and it's still uh, a, a useful uh, framework but uh, uh, having uh, said that and to some to some of you I mean this may just repeat I mean what you have what you have read so I'm sorry if I Board, some of you. Um, but let us now take a, a kind of a, a look at historical change. 
Uh, I do that in, in two ways, uh, both as a long durée, as a long uh, time period of uh, a history of modern ideologies, and a, um, a brief history of what has happened in the most recent years, including this, <coughs> this year we are still in. Um, you know, the, uh, the word ideology, I mean, it was coined in the, in the early 19th century. And uh, um, political ideologies, which is uh, a, a, a much narrower, uh, a, 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 a small part, I mean, of the whole complex of ideologies, which I refer to in kind of general theory of ideology. Um, but let us uh, concentrate here, I mean, now on, on, on political ideologies. Um, they uh, had a kind of modern prehistory in what we might call philosophies of the good society, which developed in the 17th and 18th century. Well, this is, I, I should say, a kind of history of ideology which only refers to the, uh, uh, the Euro-Atlantic uh, area. Uh, I'm not competent quite to, to sort of uh, make this a global history. Um, uh, so the, these philosophers, uh, philosophies of the good society, I mean, uh, uh, those of you who are interested in political theory, have all of them, uh, all of you encountered them, Hobbes, Locke, Montesquieu, Condorcet, um, Rousseau, and others, uh, who uh, were quite important um, figures in the intellectual debate of, of their centuries. And uh, towards the end of the 18th century, I mean, some of these philosophies, particularly that of Rousseau, became uh, quite important intellectual currents and, and played a role in the, in the French Revolution. Uh, then the, the, uh, but the, uh, what we recognize as modern political ideologies actually developed only in the 19th century after the French Revolution. Uh, and the 19th century, I mean, was the, uh, was the century of is. That was the, uh, and all these isms had their origin in, in, in Europe. Um, whether, I mean, there were monarchism, legitimism, republicanism, liberalism, socialism, conservatism, nationalism, historicism, all of them. Uh, um, and um, they uh, uh, referred to. Uh, political uh, utopias or uh, counter-utopias or dystopias um, and they uh, as isms they uh, uh, form the basis of collective identities you could uh, define yourself or identify yourself as a uh, as a republican as a, an adherent to Republicanism, or Republican ideology, or to liberalism, or conservatism, or socialism, or anarchism. Um, and um, in the, what then happened in the 20th century was that these uh, 19th century utopias and uh, uh, political goals. Um, and political identities uh, crystallized into uh, <coughs> strategies of power and organizations of identities. Socialist movement, the liberal movement, uh, and later, specifically 20th century Eastern fascism. 
So in, in this sense, I mean, the, the, the 20th century had a, a very special uh, uh, road in the long history of, of ideologies. Uh, when this kind of ethnic identity I mean, were, uh, became uh, organizational or organized movements and strategies of politics. So you had in the uh, uh, in the 20th century a, a set, I mean there are others, I mean like uh, fascists for instance, but also had uh, a, a large number I mean, of important ideological rallies and, and collective identities around a particular political ideology. And uh, uh, these political ideologies, I mean, were uh, tended to be organized and they tended to be um, uh, objects of identification to identify themselves as a socialist or a nationalist, Christian Democrat or a Buddhist nationalist in Sri Lanka. <coughs> now, uh, I'm going to argue that uh, this is something which is now changing in, in, in our, uh, our century into new kinds of ideological mobilizations. But let us... Uh, before we do that, uh, take a look at three decades of ideological changes. Um, and it, it, it's structured around the, the argument that um, uh, there are uh, three levels of, uh, of defending or attacking something. Um, You can either uh, argue about what is, what exists. Uh, is there a ruling class or not? For instance? That's a question of what is. And the question is, I mean, is that good or bad? And uh, there is a, a third argument about, I mean, uh, is a society without a ruling class possible or not? Um, and if we take those, those uh, 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 categories, uh, one of the, uh, the things which has, uh, uh, which has changed uh, very substantially in this three decades has been that the, the space of social imagination has changed uh, very much. And we can see that also in sociology and, uh, and, and political science. I mean, that, uh, the, if we ask ourselves, where is society today? I mean, most of us would tend to see it as the world. Whereas uh, 20, 30 years ago, I mean, the spontaneous or at least implicit answer was that society, well, that's American society, or Swedish society, or French society, what have you. So the, the world, I mean, in, uh, in, there's a new space of, of social imagination, of social ideological discussion. And there's also uh, uh, an interesting emergence of uh, continents, which uh, uh, was also, I mean, something rather rarely talked about, I mean, three decades ago, most clearly in, in, in Europe, of course. The, the changes of what is good and bad, and what is possible and impossible, uh, have also, of course, uh, uh, changed, although we don't need to elucidate that as uh, a bit self evident once it's, it's um, uh, formulated as a, uh, as a question. Um, but the, the um, what is um, really radically new, I think, in the ideological dynamics of the social movements of the last year is uh, uh, something else. It's a new kind of uh, re-articulation <coughs> of, of uh, uh, ideology and of the balance. 
uh, it uh, dawned upon me in, in Spain, uh, uh, discussing uh, with uh, people from the so-called indignados, the uh, indignant, indignant movement in, in, in Spain, which is a um, multifaceted, quite large uh, uh, movement um, which uh, has some uh, similarities with the 1968 uh, uh, movement, including uh, the, the intellectual cadence uh, of it. I mean, they tend to be um, um, uh, tend to be uh, graduate students or junior lecturers or teaching assistants at, at universities with less point of views and so on. That was certainly the case of the the student movement of the 1960s. Uh, but um, it's a much broader movement. I mean, it's not confined to universities. Actually, it's, uh, it's centered not in university at all, but in, in the center of Madrid, at the Puerta del Sol. Um, but what is, uh, what is interesting, uh, uh, what is to some extent similar to the early 1968 movement, uh, not to it became after 19 after 1969-70, is, um, is a series of, of radical demands without any um, uh, left-wing or radical identity. Many of the, the, the sort of the uh, anonymous uh, 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 intellectuals of these movements uh, are or have been in active in left-wing groups of one kind or another. But the movement as such deliberately will refrain from any, uh, it doesn't posit itself as socialist or uh, revolutionary or, 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 or uh, uh, it's, uh, well, we'll go a little bit further into its kind of uh, combination in a moment. Um, there are other uh, 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 new articulations of ideology, I mean, uh, particularly in, in areas of Latin America and in, in, in Asia, you find new ethnic movements which are not nationalist in the classical uh, uh, sense but are, are uh, uh, specific in their kind of ethnic cultural uh, claims. Although they, they usually do base themselves on some kind of ethnic identity. And we have uh, new uh, 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 ways of, of combining uh, pious uh, 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 Muslim uh, faith with uh, secular ideologies. Is, uh, so, I mean, something very, uh, a very significant part of the of the Arab rebellions and the Arab uh, revolutions. How how stable these uh, new articulations of, of of religious faith with secular ideologies will turn out after the revolution? That's an open question, but in, in the process of revolution, they were absolutely crucial in, in making possible, I mean, the, the uh, alliances and, and the cooperation between Islamists and, and, and secular forces. And uh, you have in, in, in this country, I mean, the uh, one of the most successful examples of uh, this new kind of of ideological uh, rearticulations on the right. I mean, the American Tea Party, which, um, as we know, I mean, from empirical um, studies of the, its composition, it's uh, 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 largely, or no, not exclusively, but it's it's largely composed. I mean, of the most religious and uh, uh, most racist or at least uh, 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 least non-racist <laughs> uh, 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 forces of the Republican right. Uh, but that's not the, the, the way they, they present themselves. 
they operate and operate very successfully as a as an anti big government movement, and um, sometimes uh, also um, anti big capital. So these these kind of new articulations of of of, of uh, ideological new ideological articulations of protest movements is not something which is confined to the left, but it's a game which is played also by the by the right, which the um, American, the, the other spectrum of the American politics is only recently uh, beginning to play with the uh, Occupy movement. Um, so uh, what can we uh, say about what the, the, this new ideological dynamic, which we, we do find, I mean, in the uh, Alter globalization movements and in the Mediterranean uh, uh, revolts and revolutions, um, the revolutions on the southern shore of the Mediterranean and the, the revolts and rebellions on the uh, western, northern, and, and eastern uh, shores of the, uh, what is the Mediterranean. Um, I think it, it can probably be summarized as a combination of rejection and pra or, or rejectionism and pragmatism. And uh, I think the first uh, powerful uh, example of this occurred in, in, in Argentina uh, in the wake of the uh, collapse of the uh, neoliberal economic model in 2001. Um, and it was summed up, I mean, in, in, in this wonderful uh, slogan, uh, which I'm not quite sure how I uh, should translate adequately in or, or el with similar eloquence uh, into English, que se vayan todos, uh, they should all go or something. I mean, the first two kind of rejection of the whole political class, and the political system, the economic system. Because if I am those, uh, let them all go to hell. Um, and uh, it uh, it was a, a, a quite quite powerful uh, uh, movement, although it was uh, also a pragmatic movement. I mean, like the Mediterranean movements, in the sense that they, there was nothing doctrinaire, no, nothing programmatic. There was no strategy or anything. Uh, and it was an openness, I mean, to discuss with everybody who uh, uh, accepted, I mean, the, uh, the premises that the status quo is, is unacceptable. Um, and um, this is uh, uh, something, I mean, rather different, I mean, from the classical uh, uh, 20th century ethnic uh, movement. Though it does have, as I said, I mean, some uh, uh, some similarities with the early uh, 1968 student movement, but that movement was confined to, to universities. And one of the fascinating aspects of, of these new movements is that they are not. And in, the, um, in, um, uh, in Spain, for instance, I mean, Los Indignados, the indignant movement, is, is, is centered in, in the city centers of Madrid and Barcelona and Sevilla. And when they have to move out of the uh, central squares, they, they don't retreat to the universities, but they go into the various neighborhoods of the, of the city. Um, and uh, so, uh, we, we uh, sum up here. Um, uh, I, I end with this with a set of question marks rather than uh, conclusions. I'll add a, a, a writer which is uh, a bit more conclusive. But on the 21st century perspectives of ideological dynamics, I think speaking in 2011, so one has to be pretty cautious. Um, but the question is, I mean, whether uh, we will see now, or whether we are seeing, 
and have already we have already experienced, I think, quite a lot of, I mean, the uh, uh, decline of ISPs as ideological communities. Uh, the uh, uh, most of the isms had a, a conception of the future, of a future society, kind of goal. Uh, they were all part of the, uh, the uh, exception of, of uh, classical Tory conservatism. They were all part of a modernist vision of the world, and therefore all of them. I mean, had a a. Uh, a vision of the future, a goal they were striving uh, towards. And we may now ask ourselves, uh, uh, and uh, if we look around, I mean, the political discourse and the major political parties and political movements in the North Atlantic area, uh, it's striking. I mean, how the future has disappeared, I mean, from, from you, for all of them, from the Christian Democrats, the Social Democrats, um, even uh, from many uh, uh, socialist parties, although they are still uh, programmatically concerned, uh, programmatically committed to to a socialist future, but uh, it, it's become a fairly distant and an unclear, very kind of hazy mist in, on the horizon. Um, we may ask ourselves, I mean, whether uh, this is something which will characterize, I mean, the whole North Atlantic area in its uh, period of beginning decline, and whether, I mean, uh, conceptions of the future uh, will be uh, uh, vibrant and important as mobilizing people and as guiding uh, political behavior uh, primarily in uh, Asia and Africa. I don't have an, an answer to this. I'm not sort of making any real claims. I, so I think, I mean, this is a question which, which should be raised. Uh, and instead of, of, of ideological isps and ideological commitments, is it possible that we are facing a kind of a political dynamic which will uh, alternate between um, periods of, of pragmatism, of, of managing the, uh, the present, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, leading to one crisis or another, which in turn spawns a uh, uh, rejectionism of the, uh, of the sort. I mean, we have seen um, very powerful example, examples of it in the Mediterranean. Uh, movement. And um, given, I mean, Eric's uh, 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 fascinating project of real utopias, perhaps, I mean, that's uh, uh, what's going to, to characterize uh, intelle intellectual and political discussion in this century rather than, than the future, because a, a, a utopia is not, uh, is not a future. Is, a, is, a, um, is an experiment of, uh, of thought and of hope. Well, these are all, I mean, questions and, and uh, 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 question marks. Um, I should perhaps, I mean, given the, uh, the background or the context of this uh, 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 seminar and, and the relationship of this uh, work on, on ideology, to Marx and Marxism, and with a with a few words of how I see the the, um, the future of Marxism, which is one is of course, and um, well, as you may have uh, 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 noticed uh, from, particularly if you were here uh, uh, yesterday, I I'm still uh, uh, very much committed, I mean, to Marxian analysis of, of, um, uh, of society and of capitalism. And I think, I mean, it's still a, a, a very uh, powerful and useful uh, analytical tool. And there's also a, 
uh, an important uh, value call in it. I mean, it's, um, uh, its commitment to human emancipation. Now, I mean, we may be uh, much less sure of what human emancipation concretely means. It's very, well, we'll see it as multifaceted and multidimensional. But nevertheless, I mean, we, we do know I mean, that emancipation is the opposite to oppression and exploitation, to inequality, um, to uh, uh, hierarchy, um, social uh, segregation, and social contempt. And the, uh, the important thing about I mean, the, the Marxian social analysis was that uh, it, it argued that the, the only real uh, emancipation uh, uh, would have to come by the efforts of the oppressed and the exploited themselves. I think, I mean, this is, I, 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 in that sense, I mean, I think this, this program, this vision of society in the world, I mean, is something which will be with us I mean, for a long time to, to come. But I do think, finally, uh, and this is the end, I do think, I mean, that uh, uh, Marxism uh, will share the uh, difficult future of the isms of the 19th and 20th century. Um, that uh, 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 I, I think it's not very likely that we will see in the 21st century a, a Marxist social movement uh, with a, a kind of collective identity uh, with Marxism as an, as an ism, Marxism as an ideological community. On the other hand, I mean, uh, um, bearing in mind, I mean, what Niels Bohr said, I mean, the predictions are always difficult, particularly about the future. Uh, so uh, uh, we may qualify, I mean, this, but that in the case that the, the Marxian grand dialectic of uh, the relations and forces of production should uh, uh, return, uh, then uh, it's not inconceivable that new cohorts of Marxism, Marxists, uh, uh, might emerge. But that's something we don't know very much about today. What's the role of individual agency in all this? Oh, it's certainly, I mean, very uh, uh, important. I mean, that's the, uh, 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 that's inherent in this in this uh, 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 dialectics of the subject. I mean, that, that uh, um, each of us uh, uh, is, uh, is, um, uh, is a subject also in the sense of being an, an autonomous agent. This, this whole dialectic con, uh, conception of ideology or subjection and qualification or the duality of uh, the dialectic duality of, of, of the subject um, means exactly this. I mean, that, uh, there is a, um, uh, that all ideologies, I mean, operate through, through uh, uh, individual agency. Uh, having said that, on the other hand, of course, it's, uh, uh, as social scientists, I mean, we we uh, we notice, of course, and have to notice that um, um, although I mean, each of us may have a free will, uh, uh, there is always a, a kind of determinant pattern. I mean, in, in what what kind of ideas I mean, people uh, adopt. And uh, uh, in, in that sense, there is always, I mean, a, a social determination of uh, uh, 
it doesn't, uh, I mean, which operates like any other uh, social determination in the sense that, I mean, it, it, it's always probabilistic. It doesn't say, I mean, that you will have uh, 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 this kind of ideology or this kind of set of ideas, but it will, uh, uh, it will say, I mean, that in a, in a group like, like this, I mean, it's probable that there will be a certain distribution of ideas. Uh, and that uh, this distribution would change if the matrix of affirmations and, and, and sanctions change. I mean, should it uh, uh, be, for instance, I mean that uh, capitalists would, would uh, suddenly become compatible with uh, more open society and less uh, inequality then uh, we could predict, I mean, that uh, the, uh, the number of people, I mean, who would accept uh, and a capitalist ideology would, uh, would grow. And if the opposite happens, I mean, we should predict that, uh, should expect that the, uh, the, uh, the number of people, the proportion of people who reject a uh, liberal or conservative Capitalist ideology will decline. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you view socialism today and depending on how you view it, what you see as its uh, future? This is straightforward. Well, I, 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 I think. <laughs> I think, uh, well, two things. Um, one is I, I think that uh, uh, socialism as an ism and as an ideological community of socialists uh, 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 has declined. And it's, I can't see uh, in the foreseeable future that this ideological community will, will grow. I'm not saying that it will not. In the, uh, sometime in the future, but in the foreseeable future, I, I, I think uh, uh, <coughs> socialism as, a, as an ideological community, as an ideological movement, um, is, um, has declined and will probably continue to decline. Um, and there will be a, a radical and left wing <coughs> demands which uh, uh, Socialists, I mean, put forward in the 20th century, uh, will probably be put forward in, in <coughs> terms not using, I mean, the word socialism. Uh, secondly, uh, the other thing I would say <coughs> is that um, socialism as a mode of production, um, in, in the Marxian sense, I think uh, is, uh, uh, has become more distant. Uh, and I gave the, what I think, I mean, uh, is the principal reason for it. I mean, that the, this uh, 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 turn of the uh, forces and the relations of production. I mean, uh, socialism in the Marxian sense was, was, a, was an industrial society. To be uh, uh, brought about by industrial class struggle and industrial working class. Well, I mean, we are now facing a, a, a different stage in the development of, of, of capitalism. And um, this means, I mean, that the, um, the socialist horizon, which many of us, I mean, still uh, uh, are committed to as a, as a value. Uh, is, is politically, I mean, rather distant. So it remains so, I mean, for, the, for the foreseeable future. That, that's very much in contrast, I mean, to the situation when I wrote those books in the, in the late 1970s, when I mean, it was possible to conceive, although I mean, it was turned out to I me mean, to be wrong, but it wasn't inconceivable to think of socialism as being ante portas in, 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 
France or Italy or Spain uh, at that time. Yes, please. Yeah. My question had to do with, so there is an underline of the connection between ideology and identity running through your talk and, well, and, and this is something that, you know, Lacan and, and all the others that you build upon brought and, and was later merged into the original Marxist theory of ideology, but I wonder, so it's, it seems as if you say that ideology could serve as a resource for identity building, but what about you know the base? If we all still live in what, what about what about the ba where is the base there in determining our identity and in in constraining the way that ideology can actually mobilize our identity? If we're still living in uh, in capitalist relations, if we you know if if that part of society hasn't changed, to what extent can you know, then all these, and, and without the isms, mm. then, then what is the play there, right, between ideology and identity? Mm -hmm. uh, how much can, you know, our identities and our bodies, which are situated, you know, in these interactions, um, what, what is your, again, foresight for the future? My second question had to do with um, the state linking what you spoke about yesterday with, um, with, um, the shifting of new zones and new eras, and well, we, you know, for the class we all read um, your theory of how states are shaped by the relations of production. And I know that ideologies seem to be able to change regimes, maybe not so much change states, but states are a player there, and they're uh, and they're pushed from within the inside and the outside. Um, what what would ideology and the developments of the you know, the, the end of isms, what would that do to the states? Hmm. Well, uh, in, in, um, in a general sense, I mean, of uh, uh, a theory of ideology, uh, uh, which, I mean, by the way, I should uh, emphasize, I mean, it's not uh, uh, the narrow uh, meaning of ideology which uh, also occurs in the Marxian tradition, I mean, in the sense of the German ideology. So, I mean, I'm talking about ideology in a, in a much broader sense, I mean, which uh, I learned from, from, from Marti Seyer. Uh, and, and in this sense, um, uh, identity formation uh, occurs or takes place, I mean, through ideological interpolations. I mean, the uh, identities are shaped by ideological processes. Well, I mean, there, there, there is an intrinsic uh, relation between ideologies and, and identities. Um, now, the, uh, the question about the, the state and the, the political ideologies, the isms and, and ideologies as um, ideological communities, um, Well, uh, uh, one uh, obvious uh, uh, cons consequence of it is the uh, uh, the uh, like that there is a less of a there is less of a, a programmatic or dynamic ideological input into uh, into the state. Although uh, 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 the the state is, uh, or states are uh, always, I mean, in, embedded in the whole set of social relations, economic and political and relations to to other uh, uh, states, and, and um, the the kind of the fundamental character of the of the state is uh, less shaped by, 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 by ideology than by these other processes. Um, so that means that the, um, uh, 
the direct and immediate and short-term effects of the ideological change uh, on the functioning of the state and of changes of states. So, I mean, is not that primary, is not that uh, important. I mean, it will be decided by other uh, other factors. I mean, what will happen, for instance, I mean, with the to the Egyptian or the Tunisian state, I mean, or in the Libyan state, after the uh, um, Arab Revolution, will not be um, determined. Maybe it would be influenced by, by it would be affected by it, but it would certainly not be determined by, uh, by ideology. And, and, and now, of course, I mean, less than, than previously, because of this new uh, the much vaguer articulations of ideology of this combination of rejectionism and, and pragmatism instead of uh, ideological identities and programs and doctrine. But we, we do know, I mean, from the, both from the history of revolutions and from the history of reformist governments, or for that matter, counter-revolutionary governments and counter-reformist uh, governments that that uh, they their course, their actual course I mean, uh, in power uh, is doesn't usually, I mean, uh, doesn't actually follow, I mean, their, their ideological programs. And now, I mean, the programs are vaguer than ever. So, um, than other forces, I mean, would be probably <coughs> more important in determining the state. So, yeah. If I can attempt to provoke you a little bit. Um, I, I think well, I agree. You always try. <laughs> <laughs> I think I agree with uh, everything you say about the future of Marxism, except perhaps the fourth point. The fourth point, because I, I don't know if there is going to be a long run. But um, I, I want to ask you, broadly considered, uh, is it such a bad thing? Would it be such a bad thing if it disappears, or would it necessarily be a good thing if uh, it reappears at some point? I think there, there's a case to be made that in order for, for the new to really emerge, the old has to die. And I think you see in, in many countries, in fact, uh, that you've got you've got new new ideas, new ideologies, new potentials for a left to emerge, but there is sort of a zombie left. I'm thinking more in terms of politics and that than mm. academia here, but there's a sort of zombie left that is often primarily animated simply by Marxism, has very little else to, to keep it going. You've got the Arab world that just had its 1848, but it's not, nothing ever repeats itself. It's, it's 1848, but it's different too, and is there not a need for new emancipatory ideologies that weren't born 160 years ago in an entirely different world. Mm. Well, I, uh, I have to disappoint you. I mean, you don't really provoke me. <laughs> <laughs> I've uh, asked myself that question too. So, but I haven't uh, come to a, a conclusion. I mean, I, um, I still have a, a, a kind of commitment to, uh, to Marx. Uh, um, both, I mean, his concept or, or conception of human emancipation and his, his way, uh, his basic approach of, of, to social analysis, particularly in, in, uh, um, looking out I mean, for social dialectics, is an incredibly fruitful uh, way of looking at things. Um, uh, but with, with respect, I mean, to the uh, desirability of the survival or the indesirability of, of Marxism, as it is, I, I, uh, I think I refrain from uh, from judgment. So, I mean, well, uh, um, it's, it would be a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, uh, it would be a bad thing it would, if it would uh, uh, entail a, a, a loss of 
historical experience, and historical uh, learning I mean, from the long lost tradition. That's that's for sure. But for the rest, uh, um, I, I don't think it would necessarily. Be um, yeah. <coughs> um, thank you. The, the framework for studying ideology that you have is a very cognitive one. That is, you have three questions, what is, what exists, what are possible, and there are mm. answers that people have. Mm. Mm. The, ans the answers are essentially ideas that people then hold and are internalized in a way that we constitute frameworks. Mm. Um, <clears throat> there's also, though, the question of the emotional and symbolic level and whether that's properly thought of as also part of ideology or not. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, when I, I mean, though, there's a, say, some students who have taken my, uh, my course in which I lecture on Terraborn's view of ideology. <laughs> <laughs> and I draw the distinction between ideology and culture in these terms, so that mm -hmm. you can talk about, for example, um, bourgeois culture mm -hmm. is actually creating dispositions to be competitive. Mm. And bourgeois ideology that tells you it's a good thing to be competitive. Uh, but mm. that you can have the disposition without, you can have the ideology without the disposition, and you can have the disposition without the ideology. So mm. You, mm. part of what was called consciousness raising is, in the women's movement, was men mm. who had masculine dispositions to be aggressive and domineering, mm. nevertheless could change their views, their ide ideologies, mm. about the desirability, and therefore, try to transform their dispositions by design, by putting themselves in different. So, I mean, that's just mm. the way I, yeah. and my gloss on it is a contrast yeah. between ideology and culture as, as kind of parallel tracks, which then may mm. constitute another source of contradiction. And that culture uh, uh, will potentially define in terms of disposition. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So culture is the way the dispositions are instantiated, mm. ideology is the way the corresponding ideas are. Mm. Affirmations and sanctions affect the ideas because yeah, they're yeah, interpretations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have another layer then, you can have contradictions that are internal mm. between mm. culture and ideology, as well as yeah, contradictions yeah, between yeah, the subject yeah. and the... Now, I think that's a, 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 a very fruitful uh, distinction. And, uh, I, uh, I guess I wish I had uh, developed that myself. <laughs> uh, uh, I, uh, I haven't uh, uh, worked that much. I mean, on, on, on ideology since since that book. Uh, uh, um, but I, I think that's a very fruitful thing. Uh, I should say that uh, about symbols. So that's something I'm actually working on. Um, <clears throat> although if, uh, I'm, I'm still I'm working on it more in a uh, in an empirical and historical sense. I mean, theoretical sense of the to do that too. Um, uh, one of the, or actually the biggest project I'm, I'm uh, currently working on is a project on cities of power and uh, how, how cities represent political power. And this means um, uh, um, uh, a focus on political iconography and uh, of um, um, kind of symbolism, I mean, how, um, how cities may uh, symbolize political power, and for that matter, uh, resistance to, to uh, the power. And um, I do think, I mean, they're both uh, uh, this distinction, I mean, between culture and ideology, that we made a, 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 uh, uh, also a specific study of of, uh, of symbols, including political symbols, and something which uh, is important and, and interesting, and uh, has to be seen as at least analytically uh, distinctive. I mean, from the uh, analysis of ideology. Presented here. So, yes, I mean, that's a good point. Well, as you know, I mean, here is an incredibly wise man, so I mean, you should expect something important to add on this topic. Any, any further 
questions or issues for tonight. Um, you mentioned in one of your slides postmodernism and its rejection of all kind of futurisms. I was just wondering if you, if you feel like this rejectionism is related to kind of a trend toward more postmodern ways of thinking. And then, if so, what impact does postmodernism or postmodern social relations and identities have on how people interact with uh, politics or with the state and the organizations? That's an important point. Um, uh, and I'm not quite sure about the, the, the answer to the first part of your, of your question. I mean, there is a certain, uh, because on, on one hand, I mean, there, there's clearly a, a certain uh, affinity between uh, postmodernism in, in the broad sense of that word and rejection uh, about uh, all these sort of master narratives of the future and these new protest movements with a combination of rejectionism and, and, and pragmatism. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, uh, uh, in, as far as I can see, I mean, there's no clear, explicit or conscious link uh, between I mean, the uh, postmodernist currents of the 1980s and 1990s and the, um, uh, these uh, new protest movements of, of, the, uh, of this year. Um, but there is a, 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 there is a clear uh, uh, affinity uh, uh, with them, and, and I do think it's, it's worthwhile uh, thinking further about it. I mean, I think you raised a very important uh, point, because I, I think that a, a rethinking of the socialist experience will have to include a, a, a rethinking of the whole modernist project, or the conception of, of the modern, modernity and modernism, uh, of which, I mean, socialism was, was clearly I mean, an important part. Um, but uh, uh, this is something, I mean, which we're only at the very beginning of Uh, I, I forgot, what was the second part of your, uh, of your question? If the rejectionism is related to kind of an increase in postmodern um, social relations or identities, what impact does that have with how people interact with the state or with civic engagement and politics? Um, I mean, for sure, mm -hmm. do postmodern people really think that, that the state is still a relevant indicator of, of social organization? Well, postmodernism, uh, uh, um, as such, has no particular uh, conception of the state. I mean, postmodernism post is, is a culture orientation uh, uh, with a, a rejection. I mean, the most distinctive feature of which is the rejection of futurism uh, of all kinds, uh, um, avant-garde, of uh, aesthetic or political or but it, it doesn't, as such, I mean, say anything, or have any idea about the, about the state, about state organization. Um, it does entail, of course, a, uh, a, um, a skepticism of, um, of the state as, as a vehicle of change. But that's, that's related, I mean, to its skepticism against all vehicles of change. So in, in, in that sense, I mean, it doesn't, uh, unless, I mean, we sort of smuggle uh, some uh, contraband uh, uh, into the uh, conception of postmodernism, I think we have to, we have to say, I mean, that it, 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 it's agnostic about the state and, and political organization. Um, yeah. Okay, I think that's all for tonight. I hope. Uh, oh, well, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure, sure, sure. Let me come back then to culture and ideology.
um, the idea of emotions being, or di of, of, um, of them being two different things. If we, on the other hand, think that emotions proceed, that, that uh, conscious beliefs, ideological beliefs, proceed in part from our dispositions and from our emotions. For instance, if you um, are disposed to competition, then you're going to believe that competition is good and construct your worldview accordingly. Um, then it's one process and not two different processes. And you might make an analytical distinction between culture and ideology, but not to say that they're empirically distinct things or that they're actually not that, 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 that they're two different processes as opposed to one. If they're one process, then are we still under theorized about how dispositions of emotions factor in? Mm, yes. Uh, although I would add one thing. I mean, I don't think we should we should uh, uh, treat dispositions and emotions as synonymous or sort of uh, interchangeable. Um, I mean, dispositions is, is actually a much broader concept. And, and emotions, I mean, certain, certain aspects of, of emotions uh, are, are actually part of uh, ideology and, and, and certainly about uh, of, of political ideologies. I mean, uh, emotions of fear, for instance, uh, or hatred, or, uh, or pride, or uh, well, contempt, this can also be seen as a, uh, or shame. I mean, uh, Political ideologies are, are uh, I mean, in that sense, uh, I, I wouldn't say that my uh, conception of ideology is exclusively cognitive. I mean, it, it, the, uh, uh, it, it explicitly, I mean, refers to the operation of, of uh, emotions in processes of domination, particularly, I mean, the emotional fear, but we also think of other uh, other emotions, uh, and then, uh, then of course you're right. I mean, in, in the general argument, I mean that um, if we think that we have to distinguish two things analytically, I mean, like culture and ideology, that doesn't mean I mean that they are empirically necessarily uh, separate. Is not interconnected. <coughs> there may be in, in contradiction, as you said, perhaps, but uh, um, uh, generally speaking, I mean, an analytical distinction uh, is not the same thing as an empirical separation. There's a lot more to talk about that thing. That may be one of the things we can pursue in tomorrow's discussion. But I think for now we should wrap up and we'll.